Welcome to Gamification of Society, Time to Grow Up. Um, just before we kind of get stuck in, if you want to tweet, it'd be good. Um, try and use the hashtag Battle of Ideas and even hashtag Gamification so we can let the outside <coughs> world know what we're talking about. Um, the format is uh, one and a quarter hours, so it's quite quick, but I really do want to get a lot of uh, audience participation into this, into this discussion, which I think is very timely. So as you know by now, the Battle of Ideas is all about um, not just the panel, but it's yourself as well, creating a debate about the, the themes you sort of uh, encountered through the discussion. The discussion for me um, is, in terms of gamification, I think is uh, we're at a time where so many people now are playing video games. Um, it kind of demonstrates that us as adults are very capable, if we haven't been before, of achieving things like goals, uh, incentives and scoring points and being kind of competitive but in a sort of a game environment. And that's kind of become very mainstream through the, the, the rise of PlayStation and all the other sort of video gaming sort of uh, culture we've started to kind of grow up with. So perhaps it's no surprise then that people like policymakers, health campaigners, charities, even educators and employees, employers rather, are themselves very curious about the merits of gamification. Um, to help them overcome their own difficulties, perhaps crisis of authority or the inability of teachers to teach, that they can now use games to get their kids engaged. So, you know, otherwise, games can also do good things. So we can collectively help scientists solve diseases and even spot new star constellations by playing games and using our computing power. So, of course, games are not all bad. This Debate is, is a question really about, you know, is gamification just another kind of cynical marketing trick that we're unlocking new tricks to help us live our lives perhaps in more fun and better, better and fulfilling ways? Is gamification a good or a bad thing? And I've got a great panel who can really help us explore this issue. So I'm just going to introduce them very briefly, but of course, if you want to know more about them, do look at the Battle of Ideas website for their full biography and background. So in order of speaking, on my immediate left, I've got Tor Giswold, Director, Digital PwC, former consultant, Riot Games, League of Legends, um, next to speak, Andrew Alowski, who's the executive editor, The Register, assistant producer, all watched over by machines of loving grace. Then next to speak will be Cam Starr, who's the chief play officer at PlayGen and also the founder of Digital Shoreditch. And then last, Dr. Shirley Dent, who's founder, Spark Mobile, communication specialist, currently working with the British Veterinary Association media team and author, Radical Blake. So... Before I bring the speakers in um, for five minutes each, um, I'm just going to say that we're also going to have a, a very brief panel discussion for five, ten minutes, and then it'll be your, your chance to kind of come back on what you've heard and let the, the debate begin. So, to kick us off, Tor. So, I don't know how many of you were here for the last discussion here. Uh, it uh, was a lot of discussion around the Onion Router Tor, so I'm uh, very happy to present my name as Tor now. It's very, very, very <laughs> topical. So, part of my... A uh, weird and wonderful background is in games. Um, I'm also an engineer, I'm a consultant, and I consider myself a digital native for those that uh, take that into account. This is like being at the AA, isn't it? I'm a consultant. <laughs> and I haven't got a PowerPoint, which makes me very twitchy. Because all <laughs> consultants have to have PowerPoints. Very true. So, being an engineer, I'm going to start off by giving you some facts and figures, because that's the only way I can, uh, can do things. So, I've spent quite a lot of time working for a company called Riot Games on a game called League of Legends. I don't know how many of you play League of Legends. Do any of you play League of Legends, by the way? Okay, there's actually a few, few in the audience. League of Legends is like crack cocaine. <laughs> It's the world's largest online game, and uh, very little is known about it, which is a bit weird. Around 160 million boys in the age 16 to 25 play Le League of Legends. Around 10 million of them are online playing at any one time of day and night. They log in and concentrate deeply on a game for three and a half hours at a time. Most of you, at least those of you who are parents, will probably have a problem understanding that your sons or daughters can concentrate on anything for three and a half hours at a time. 
not least of all something that actually requires a lot of concentration and is very, very hard to master. But why is this important to the rest of society and what we do? Well, we're going into a period now where in around 2017, what we call digital natives is going to overtake the rest of the population in, online and in the rest of society. Generally in consultancy, in digital consultancy, we divide all of us online or digital people into three groups. The digital natives, that's the up and coming generation that's grown up with the internet. There's the transitionals, those of us that have uh, uh, lived with the internet for a long time and use it, but use it as a tool. And then there's the, tradi the traditional users that really don't understand the internet and really only use it if, if they have to. But we're coming to an age now where we will be over, all the others of us in total will be overtaken by the digital natives. And they think and behave very differently from the rest of us when it comes to, to media. And one of the things we have a real problem with, regardless of how we're going to use it, is to catch a piece of their attention. And it's, undoubt, it's doubtless that games <coughs> seem to catch their attention regardless of how we, however we want to do it. Give you an example of a slightly different type of game because I'm Norwegian. It's an interesting one, an interesting game ladder in all the newspapers and online at the moment. Because in Norway, you publish everyone's tax returns on the internet. Uh, actually, I think you did it yesterday. And there's game ladders everywhere now telling you how much tax you paid last uh, year. Uh, talk about social gaming and think about tax ladders. Does that mean that people? try to not avoid paying tax because the neighbors will uh, see it and uh, condemn them. That's a form of gaming and gamification as well. The number of people playing games in the world at the moment is absolutely staggering. And I've got 60 seconds to go now, by the way. Uh, I'm gaming you. Yeah, you're gaming me. Uh, according to one of the global market reports, Around 1.2 billion players will be playing serious games by the end of this year on a frequent basis. That is a lot of people. That's actually <coughs> half of the number of people in the world that's on the internet. So we have to take this trend very seriously and see whether we can use it for the power of good as well, not just for slaughtering people. Uh, and the kind of games I know very well also promotes uh, a lot of cooperation, a lot of thinking, requires great strategy and cooperation between fairly large groups of people. I'm not going to say much more because I haven't got much more time than that, but that gives you something to think about. It's something we can't avoid <coughs> having an opinion on if we want to think about the generation growing up now. Thank you very much. So, Andrew. Hello. Yeah, I'm not sure um, that those are enormous and quite mind-boggling figures, but um, I'm not sure people are playing more games now uh, or whether we're simply watching people play games now. Um, how much attention has been drawn from television and how much would be... Uh, when we are all teenagers, we'd be so bored you'd literally bet on two flies climbing up a wall as a form of a game. It just wasn't being watched, measured and monitored. It wasn't collecting big data. Um, I have nothing against uh, the idea of making things a little bit more fun. Um, I think it's uh, a tr tremendously uh, educational. So, um, but, but I do have kind of a problem with the idea of funification as, uh, as, as a general mode of, of trying to engage people, because it is fundamentally a rather insulting way of, of, of treating people. Yeah. One of the problems when you have a great a mass of data suddenly is that people start wanting to use it. Uh, there are certainly authoritarian ways of using it, uh, as we've seen with Nudge. I think both Nudge and Funification uh, take a rather uh, dim view of, of what people actually uh, respond to. Um, essentially, they take a behaviourist view of, of, of a human as something like a rat that, that, that needs responds to very crude stimuli. Um, my problem with gamification isn't really with gamification itself. It's with the fact that in fundamental political policy issues, um, we live in a kind of a game world, a fantasy world. Uh, I, I mean, I can spend very little, I have very little motivation to not gaming and a lot of what the people here are doing when the, uh, the actual policies are 
fantasy policies themselves, and, and we have to engage on those in, in, in terms that they are a fantasy. I'll give you several ideas. Um, <coughs> the notion that news media have that we are no longer interested in stories or narratives, but we can absorb something through an infographic is an extraordinary idea, you know, fundamentally insulting to us. The idea of net neutrality is not so much a big issue in Europe, um, but it is in America. That is essentially a fantasy view of how networks work. Technically, it's, it's, it's um, like trying to argue with somebody who's describing a unicorn, then asks you whether they're left-handed or right-handed. It's really hard to answer that question. And yet this is a topic that, that uh, a great deal of hot air has expanded about. Packets are not people. It's a case of a fantasy world where there's a projection. Packets are not people, as Martin Geddes, the network analyst and, and strategist, says. There's no good karma in being even-handed to packets of data. The Internet's never actually worked like that. So you're projecting a human right onto an inanimate, inanimate object. Um, that seems to be gamifying the idea of digital policy itself. Um, there are more of these fantasies abound. Uh, the idea of social mobility is taking something of a knocking now. I think if you work in media or maybe even um, development, you need to have fairly wealthy parents if you want to do it in London. But we sold this idea that, that miracles happen from two kids in a garage, that social mobility is, that meritocracy is still here and strong, because anybody can do it. That's a, that's a kind of myth, I think. It needs to be looked at very closely. And there's also something we touched on this morning in a really interesting session, in that if you show small children HTML and get them to do angle brackets around the letter B, then some kind of knowledge is somehow passed on symbolically. I think that's a fundamentally a strange idea, almost a pagan idea, that if they stare at these mystical runes, they'll gain some kind of deep knowledge and wisdom. There are, there are two strands. I've done two very kind of odd and different panels today, and they have something in common, which is that policymakers love to inhabit this fantasy world, this game world, in which the good guys wear white hats, the bad guys wear black hats, and it's an incredibly simplified way of looking at things. Um, just to touch on some of the dangers of gamification, I was reading something I never normally read, but it's uh, a Fabian Society pamphlet about the uh, agonising about the rise of UKIP. And there's a sentence in that which really caught my eye, which is that local organisations and institutions that we could rely on, community institutions, have, have, have fallen into abeyance. And issues that irritate people locally are now dealt with through a transactional complaint redress model. In other words, there's a very mechanised, game-like view of treating people um, if they're happy, they'll tick a box, say yes. If they're not, they'll say no. And that kind of, if you're going to win hearts and minds, if you don't like UKIP, if you don't like what they're saying, if you're going to win their hearts and minds, you have to do more than simply treat them as a, as a rat in a maze. Um, so I've probably gone massively off topic, but Martin said it wouldn't be too bad. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. So next up is uh, Cam, and Cam has been a bit cheeky because he's actually done his on slides. So... Uh... Hello. 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 Hiya. Hiya. Right. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. I started gaming in 1986. That's when I started to first my first get make my first game. About 15 years ago, I found myself working for the makers of people like Monopoly, at Hasbro, making games that were selling millions, millions and millions. And these kids, these millions of kids, boys and girls, were playing them, and we were giving them nothing, nothing but entertainment. I, I, I got worried. I saw my little brother, who's a lot younger than me, wasting his life, and I thought, hang on a minute. There's more to life than this. There's more to games than just entertainment. And so I started this company, PlayGen, in 2001, with the sole mission of gaming for the greater good. It's taken me to all sorts of different places. These are some of the things I've done in the last 13 years. I've worked on some very interactable, in, in, interactable? Uh, you know the word, uh, things that are difficult, and, you know, the, the, to, to, to kind of, Reflect back on funnification. Uh, the medium of game is the way we experience the world. The game is to play, and to play is to explore, and to explore is to discover, and to discover is perhaps to understand. So um, these are some of the things you'll see. I'm not going to take you through each one of them. Some of them policy, some of them are uh, to do with creativity. Right now, I really love creativity and learning. I even gamified gamification. So and I have some packs for you later, which we'll give out as a prize. So this is the gamification of gamification. With that game, you can turn anything into a game. It is really the meta of the meta. And why would I do that? And apologies if I'm playing this uh, on an iPad just straight from PowerPoint. It just doesn't want to go full screen. Thanks, Apple. Um, the guy in the middle is my dad. He's really into pumpkins. 
<laughs> okay, the guy in the middle is not my dad, but can you imagine if that was your dad and he was into pumpkins? Like, you know, some people are well into competition, right? Um, and, well, you know, you stumble across this on the lamppost. Slightly used rubber fist. Yeah, curious. Why have some of these been taken away? Because we want to know. We want to know what's coming up. We are curious about the world, and we like the idea of play. But what does the science say? Uh, well, uh, being somewhat straddling the science and the business world, uh, I decided to do my own systematic analysis of all the empirical evidence that there was around gamification. Does the bloody thing work? So I started about 3,000, um, 3,500 papers through a laborious process. I identified 300 experiments and went through it. 94% um, of those who reported on motivation claimed that it increases user motivation. 94%. Kapow. Um, but does it actually work? That's what I wanted to know. Did people buy more? Did they get better grades? Did they change their behavior? Did it work? Really, did it work? Uh, well, mm, half the time, no. Uh, didn't do anything. 26% uh, of the time, uh, it made it worse. It actually made it worse. People bought less, they got worse grades, they were you know, disenfranchised, they didn't, just hated it. Only worked 23% of the time. 23%, 23%, that's not very much. Yes, it is actually very much. What other medium do you know that has a 23% success? Well, entertainment, games, only 4% are profitable. Right. Films, 7%. Music, 10%. 23%, I'll take 23%. Just bear in mind that about 80% of the time it doesn't work. But why? Why doesn't it work? So the losers, the people who failed miserably, the 26% that really messed up with the users' heads, what were they doing? They were thinking about the commissioner's perspective. They had a behavioralist model. B.F. Skinner and his rats. Here's a lot to answer for. Um, overt, overt emphasis on competition. There was no game designer in sight. Nobody that knew user experience, no intrinsic motivations, no narrative, no utility. And again, I'm going to come back to the funnification. Is it all right to have narrative then? Is narrative a bad thing? Um, and you know, Conchita, what does she do, right? Um, well, she gives you these things, a profound appreciation of the intrinsic motivations of the users. Good social interaction, give them what they want. Balance between competition, collaboration, individual reward. Think about the psychology and the behavioral science behind it. And put the goals, the needs, and the desires of the people who are playing it first. Put those first. So, to sum up in my five minutes, create intrin intrinsically meaningful social experiences with high utility. Very easy to say. Very, very, very difficult to do. Thank you. Last, uh, Shirley. I want to start at a place I think we can all relate to, which is pissing on flies in <laughs> toilets. And anybody who's been around the discussion of behavioural science will recognise that as Thaler and Sunstein's very well-known example from Nudge. And the scenario is this. Flies etched on the inside of urinals at Amsterdam Airport cut spillage, shall we say, the tinkle effect, by 80%. What happened was men played a game with themselves. They liked to aim at the flies. And actually, why not? Some things in life are worth getting right without expending too much energy or thought on. And also, I think we have to recognise, as Martin said in his um, introduction, there is some very innovative, innovative harnessing of gaming enthusiasts, geeks between us friends, in modelling things like disease epidemiology. What's not to like? Nothing. But, and it's a big but, I do have a problem with the rise of gamification, particularly when it fills the void of political engagement. So I'm hoping Cam and Tor can put me right here. I think I've got more of an ally, ally with um, Andrew here. There are three things I want to assert very quickly here today. And linking all of these three things is this. I think human encounters matter, and gamification is the diminishment of these encounters. So I want to argue that game playing and we are game-playing and storytelling creatures that both of these things, gameplay and storytelling, at their best, involve a certain type of encounter. Now, I think politics involves an encounter, but I think it's different. On gamification, here comes the criticism, this is my third point, at its most insidious, I think it's an instrumental dead hand in those very different human encounters I've already mentioned, gameplay and politics. Where gameplay and storytelling concerned, I think it's a perversion of a very human instinct to tell stories and play games. Where politics is concerned, I think it's an abnegation of political conviction and argument and judgment, the theme of the battle of ideas. Let me take game playing and storytelling together first of all and explain why I think it matters that we link them. 
I also want to say I think it's better for social engineers to butt out and let game creators get on and create beautiful, inspiring, engaging games. I'm going to go to an unlikely source here, which is Michael Oakeshott's Voice of Poetry in the Conversations of Mankind. I had a quote, I'm going to cut it. I just want, and he, in this essay, he talks about the encounter of conversation and he describes it as an unrehearsed intellectual adventure. And I think that's quite useful and I like that actually. Um, as we go on. And what Oakeshott, in a nutshell, is saying is that this unrehearsed intellectual adventure is not an authoritarian to determine and it is not the outcomes that matter. On gaming and narrative, which I think is important, I'm going to fess up. I'm a literature snob. I think books are better. But, before all the gamers in the room come at me, I think we're going through a Tristan Shandy moment. <coughs> That this art form is evolving, and I think it's very interesting, narrative, encou humanly encounter-wise, where it could go. I'm just going to not go into too much detail because of time. Just mention one game which some of you may know, which is Journey from, I think, about 2012. I think there's something very interesting in that game, which I can go into more detail with um, as the discussion develops. So I think gaming can actually be a very adult thing. And herein lies the irony because I think gamification can be a very childish thing, particularly where social relations and politics are concerned. And this is my last argument, and in some ways, I think in, it is the most important argument. And it's why I put part company, ironically, with Oakeshot. Social and political en encounter is not just an unrehearsed intellectual adventure. I think in art and gaming, it can be. Politics and social relationships involve self-aware and self-interested endeavour. It's predicated on human volition, not just conversation or game playing, but contestation and cho choice, choice predicated on judgment. And this is my biggest problem with game gamification. Um, rather than convince me with rational argument, woman to woman, man to man, man to woman, and allow me to make the choice about and let me judge about whether I should smoke or not, you choose to manipulate me like a child with a little bit of tricksy gaming. It's all a bit Pavlovian for my liking. To end, I think we need to be wary of gamification as a pernicious social engineering project, which refuses to have a head-on political argument to convince adults, not game-playing children, that a course of action is the right one and allow us to judge for ourselves consciously. But, as the song says, I'm open to persuasion, so let's play a game. Convince me otherwise. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Shirley. So as I said, I, I just want to have a, a very brief sort of panel discussion, um, given what the, the speakers have just sort of said. Uh, and of course, we've got a good sort of diverse sort of set of views. We've kind of got a, a kind of a left-right split, shall we say, on this side of the table and that side of the table, I think. Um, you know, are, are, are these two sides ever, you know, are they completely opposite or are we kind of talking about things where, you know, in some senses the world can be improved by games and play uh, or even kind of politically, you know, are, you know, from kind of this side of the room, shall we say, um, you know, are we saying that, that politicians are uh, kind of making more out of games than they kind of should, uh, you know, are... I would argue perhaps to Shirley, um, you know, a question to you, you know, are politicians really sort of seriously sort of saying that, you know, policy is now being formed through kind of gameplay? Is that, is that really the case? I think there is certainly an element of that. And I think there is a kind of real bandwagon jumping moment going on in which actually it is an abnegation of having your own political vision. Um, I've got to make a confession to Tor. My 16-year-old nephew is absolutely entranced by League of Legends. He is absolutely plays it all the time. I call it League of Leprechauns to wind him up. <laughs> but I, what I would say to you is, why do you feel you need to go in there and do something socially worthy on it? Why don't you just let him get on with it? I don't actually want to know what he's doing on League of Legends. I don't understand it, but he's absolutely crazy on it. Actually, I think there is a world of play, and I think this idea that we can somehow reach the young people, somehow reach the digital natives, we can draw this across 
and it becomes the solution for policy and actually not having the political vision to argue about bigger things in the world. I think that's really problematic. My stance is very simply, let gaming be gaming. Let people do something interesting, wonderful, non-instrumental about it. I've got to say, I absolutely loathe these games in which you can pretend to be a poor person or you can experience what it feels like to be autistic or you can um, move me along to know why I should stop smoking. Can I just, can I just, can I just butt in and just, just okay, from that, that line of thinking there says to me that from that position, you don't want non-fiction in literature. You do not want documentaries in filmmaking. Let filmmaking be filmmaking and stories and fantasies. Do not make me a documentary. Let, let literature be stories and not non-fiction and the truth. That is the line of, that you're taking. And I don't think it's right. But Cam, do you think, because you said kind of earlier, you know, being creative and, and even the workplace is all centred around play. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of the prime way we express ourselves and even sort of generate new ideas. Is that really the case? Um, are you sort of saying that you know, the adult world, to be successful, should be more about centred around play or, or actually should we be, be more serious about how we engage with each other? Ah, I love the fact that you said the word serious. OK. Serious, the opposite of serious is not play. The opposite of serious is drab, dreary, dull. The opposite of play is not serious. And if you start from that position, you, 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 you're not getting quite the word here. But I want to pick up on one thing which we haven't addressed yet, because we are talking about a very, very broad spectrum of things. So I want to know, are we including flight simulators that train the pilots that fly us around the world in gamification? No. Ah. <laughs> I, I can actually try to answer some of that one, because when I was 18, I was drafted in the military to work at the radar station. I did military air traffic control, and we scrambled jet fighters and so on. Uh, it was much, more, much safer for us to scramble them in an electronic game than it was in real life, because people reacted very badly when I misidentified a flight over mid middle of Norway and thought it was a Russian fighter. And suddenly they had two NATO fighters up their wings. So there's something to be said for it, but in a, use that as a game is actually not a bad thing. And it is a game when you're 18 and sitting there in the middle of a mountain with an enormous simulator. And what about okay, role play? Well, can, is can, is can, role let me, play let me, games? Let me bring in um, uh, Andrew. I mean, you know, I mean, Andrew, you talk about the, the idea of funification, if you like. Um, but but actually, you know, as you're saying, uh, over a billion people are playing games, you know, every day uh, th throughout the world. And a lot of that's, you know, is a sign of creativity. It's also a sign of kind of curiosity. You know, people sort of cu cu curious sort of behaviour in terms of engaging the world, each other, uh, playing. What's wrong with that? People obviously up for doing it. I don't think anyone's said it's wrong so far. Sure. Um, I think I think what what seems to be being contested here is the political use or the value of games to achieve a certain goal. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a shortage dictionary, but the opposite of serious is not dull, it's frivolous. Um, I, 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 think the, I, think, I think the point, I think the danger, I mean... I mean we can consult Webster if you like. You said, uh, you said, it, you said this much better than, than... You expressed a lot of my concerns very, very clearly here, but um, you can't nudge your way to a better health service. Um, I, think, I think the problem is kind of... I see it sort of sociologically in which... What's different now to about 20 or 30 years ago is that you, um, politicians don't have these great big ambitions anymore and they rely on, um, yeah, they rely on managerialism and kind of technocratic sort of fixes, but they also rely now, um, and I don't think it's written about enough, on a kind of consultariat. Now, looking back at the four or five years of the coalition, I don't think there's a fad they haven't tried to embrace, whether it's neuroscience or nudge or internet startups, they are fad central. And a lot of this comes from um, the special advisors wanting to kind of be this con um, consultant. Now, um, some of my best friends are, are very, very good consultants at this kind of confluence, if you like, of media and fashion and marketing. But 
as Shirley said, the, the, the danger is that you lose sight of the bigger vision when you do this. You can't nudge your way to a better health service. And ultimately, people do realise they're being kind of pushed and prodded and manipulated. Okay, I completely Shirley, agree with that. Yep. Hold on, Ken. Uh, well, I want to um, say two things. Um, on the subject of seriousness, what, whatever the opposite we decide on, I'm with Andrew, I think it is frivolous. But actually, serious in itself and seeing a bigger political picture can be inspiring. You know, it can inspire people if we trust people. And part of my problem with gamification is not trusting people to have that argument and that conviction. And in some ways that we're tinkering around with whether people should smoke or not, or whether they should do this or that or the other, actually shows you how small and diminished actually the political vision is. And I think that is problematic. I've got to say, and I just, well, the, the second thing I want to say is, on this point of non, not having non-fiction in literature, well, of course not, because I, like everybody else in the room, I'm more, I have multiple interests. I'm a complex person. And it's the point at which I actually disagree with Andrew on the infographics. If we take um, Napoleon's invasion of uh, Russia, which, as we all know, didn't turn out that well, we can look at War and Peace absolutely tremendous piece of writing but there's also a really beautiful um, graph <coughs> done by Louis Menard which shows you at the start of the campaign and it's like this in this timeline start the campaign and you go through and they go through Russia and it's like this and it diminishes and it diminishes and it diminishes and it comes out and it's this little line and this is the troops the, the French troops going to <coughs> Russia and you see that tragedy immediately how many lives were lost in that campaign. But this is a, a round picture of human understanding. It's the literature of Tolstoy. It's this beautiful infographic. It's our political and historical understanding of that moment. So in some ways, I've got nothing against play. Why not have a, a, a little bit of playfulness? Why not have flies in toilets? But actually, we can't lose sight of being serious people because that can be inspiring and that can change the world. That's what I believe. I think gamification, you know. Ken, well, you okay, so at some point, I don't know how, but the use of game mechanics and game dynamics in order to engage, inform, and uh, inspire people has now been somewhat hijacked by the behavioral economist world. Uh, we are somehow now implying that Sunstein and Thaler, uh, Ariely and Kahneman, and perhaps George Lowenstein are, and these are the greats of behavioral economists and people who came up with the ideas of Nudge. I particularly love George Lowenstein. If you get the chance and you really fancy getting into it, he's got a fantastic book called Exotic Preferences where he does a lot of really interesting uh, experiments on people. But folks, this is not gamification. You're not talking about gamification. You're talking about behavioral economics and you're talking about a particular brand of behavioral economics which is choice architecture and you're talking in that choice architecture about a particular way of thinking that Sunstein and Thaler put, which by the way, I don't think it was a bad thing that the, beha that the behavioral insight unit at, uh, in um, the cabinet office in number 10 decided to add a single sentence, a single sentence to a letter that was sent out to people who are self-employed not changing the letter in any other way, just adding a single sentence to it, as a result of which they collected 130 million pound more taxes. There's nothing wrong with that. There so, isn't so anything wrong okay? with that. Nothing wrong with it. The argument here is it isn't a round nudge. The fly in the urinal as a, as a, as a method is but to be or not to be. It is not literature, right? It is not the works of Shakespeare. It is not the Twelve Nights. And somehow equating a sentence to a full story, I think, is rather disingenuous, and, it, and it, it serves to serve the purpose of almost clarifying what gamification is. Now, to to all of the points that have been made today, I I I completely agree with you. You cannot nudge your way into a better health service. Why are politicians jumping on this? Because they don't want to make the hard decisions, as George Lowenstein put it beautifully. Nudge is a very, very poor second-rate instrument to a, another first-rate problem. So rather than going after the food industry, taxing them for using sugar, doing things that you should be doing, 
you go, oh, well, let's try and nudge them into not eating so much. You're not really solving the problem. This has got very little to do with gamification. Well, it has, a, you know, it is, it is but can, perhaps of that but, sphere, but it's not in but there. Can, but to be fair, you know, you obviously earlier said that, you know, gamification hasn't got a complete 100% success rate, but it's sort of got 23% success rate. So what, what distinction are you putting on it in terms of, you know, its application? Where does it work and where does it fail? Because obviously with that temptation, policymakers are obviously going to try for themselves to, you know, drive health campaigns, anti-smoking campaigns and whatever. And so that's where it fails, right? Where so the where man at the top has made a decision where you're, you're not thinking mind. where's you're it not work okay. so help help the me and everyone else understand where's gamification good for and where does it fail so talk yeah, so let me take that one because uh, a lot of people in the room have a fitbit how many of you have a fitbit or similar things on you and are part of a league that tries to become healthier it's probably about eight people yeah. Yeah. okay that's a starting point that's a few more a few of you are very shy. But <laughs> it's something that is starting off very well, where we put our data out on the internet about how much we walk every day or how much we exercise every day. And that's a field where gamification has proven itself to work very well, i.e. back to health again. But back to the NHS again, if you want to. Because that's a place that works really, really well. We're going to put one of those leagues up in the new, our new offices, but when you walk into the room, you see who's walked furthest the last week and so on. It actually works with people. But I'd argue that the distinction between what you're saying and CAM isn't particularly that clear. You're, you're no. arguing a very similar sort of position about, you know, it's sort of encouraging people yeah. to incentivise and effectively they are helping themselves change their behaviour. I think there's a distinction between whether or not we want to change people's behaviour or whether we, not, we want to enlighten them. Okay? So you could make gamification okay. in order to help you understand something. Right? If you want to understand flood policy in the UK, I could get you to read 200 pages, or you could, you know, play a game for 15 minutes to understand the diversity of the issues that are around flooding, as we have done and this, you know, published. And obviously, the, the, the paper seems to suggest that at least we can impart some knowledge. I think it's very useful. If you come in and go, what do people need to understand? They need to understand this. Let's give them a tool that helps them understand it. I think that's a very nice way of thinking about it, and especially if it's, if it's a delight and you use it and you go, ah, I didn't realise it was so complicated. And just even that realisation, it's a wonderful thing. And okay. I think it's a markedly different thing to saying, hey, can you stop smoking? I looked at, at a piece of stats for just one game, and it's a game I know, where people at the moment use approximately one billion hours a week on playing the game. If you could just take a little bit of that time and turn it into something worthwhile. Wouldn't that be worth doing? <coughs> Wouldn't it be worth spending some time investigating that, looking at it from a scientific basis, seeing if we can introduce something good into all of that time? By the way, that equates to around 25 million, 25 million workers per year full-time on something. Okay. I mean, the same arguments we made as watching TV. If we sort of save 20 minutes of our collective ah. TV time, we could be doing something more productive. But ah. How many of the gamers do not have a TV, by the way? I find that quite interesting as okay. well. Because you find out that, that it may be just be taken away from TV and so forth. Right. I think we've kind of warmed things up a little bit, as you can tell. So um, now it's your turn. <laughs> Games make their bread and butter from compulsing somebody to play. I mean, you use the word mechanics, but actually it's compulsion. And you're, I've tore actually hit it, hit the nail on the head by saying like crack cocaine. And I think it's very true. And I think World of Warcraft, Farmville, they use Skinner box psychology, the same psychology that casinos use to get people to gamble, to play their games compulsively. And I'm sure every gamer in, in the room, or probably quite a few of the rest, will know somebody or have been somebody who has become compulsed by a game, and has become addicted, and has played it for hours and hours, for months and months. Now, I, the question I want to ask is, OK, there's a lot of potential. I, I think understanding the mechanics of learning from a game perspective is a, a lot of potential. But do we really want to learn those bad habits from gaming and apply it to something like work or like learning? Imagine somebody who's being compulsed to learn or compulsed to work. I think there's a very... We're not talking about the dark side of gaming here. And I think there is a dark side. And I think... Okay. Yeah. 
I'm going to take a few questions and then we can come back. So, um, yeah. Um, I work in education. I'm a teacher, and, and this year I've introduced Minecraft. I've just let kids loose on an area. And you can see how they form their own civilization and forming their own charter, and they're all sort of rules of regulations. What happens when someone lives here and there, and then someone kid coming up, well, we, why don't we invent claimers' rights? So I have a right to this land, and well, what happens if there's a grievance? And those sort of things. I mean, I'm looking to try and push this as much, and I think um, Sir Ian Livingston is now planning on opening his own school to have based on all this learning. In terms of both sides, I'd love to hear what you think about education, learning, and it's sort of from Cameron to how do you feel it could be much more improved through learning, not just the point system, but I think there's a deeper route there. And obviously the other side, what you'd like to think about, how gamifying, how that would be a bad thing, and I'd love to hear what both sides have to think on that. I have two points, really, that well, were struck by things Shirley said, but I think they addressed the whole panel, really. One thing is you tainted, or talked about manipulation and how that happens in these games, and I'm wondering, there's quite a lot of manipulation going on in our society anyway. I mean, product placement in movies, and how is it... Dif uh, to take a kind of um, well, a provocative example, how is it different to watch a film where somebody smokes a cigarette and says, ah, cigarettes of smoky smokers on whatever, they are really good, whether I chose that kind of path in a game and my character says that, and I can see that there's a difference between those two. And the other thing is about meaningful social encounters. If you asked me 20 minutes ago, I would have thought, Digital natives would already have gone as a <laughs> phrase, but um, 10 minutes ago I now realize it's quite important actually because thinking about um, how dispersed close friendship circles are today. So if I think about my friends, one of them I, I've known for 30 years now, and I'm trying to work out the non-German analog. So if I want to play a game of Cluedo with him, for example, so he lives, still lives in Germany, and, well, we talk a lot on the phone, but sometimes you don't want to talk. You want to have a meaningful social encounter, which doesn't ne necessarily say that you want to talk about something specific. Um, is it really different whether I do it online as a game or whether I do it over the phone with us both just putting up the game, game uh, in front of us? Do you, does the panel think that climate scenario, scenario modeling, is that a form of the ultimate form of gamification? I just want to start with the, with the learning, because I think that's the biggest uh, opportunity that we have. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've come, ever come across Sugata Mitra. Does anyone know who Sugata Mitra is? One hand goes up. Okay, there's an enlightened person. He has this notion of problem-based learning and the fact that you don't need a teacher anymore. And almost like what you said, you go to the students and you say, okay, what is a proton? And they're seven years old, and you, know, you get five of them around the computer, and they'll work out how atoms work 10 years ahead of what they're supposed to. And he argues that you know, the education system that we have now is, some, is a product, a great product of something that we've needed for about three or 400 years where we needed soldiers and clerks and makers in factories that don't ask questions that they remember on rote. We are going through a transition period and we need a different type of learning. And I would, I would wholeheartedly support any teacher that wants to use tools. And I see them as tools, really tools for discovery, tools for exploration. And if you are doing them in groups, even better. I've seen some amazing results out of it. For the... Um, uh, the, the climate scenario, I think things like climate, climate scenario or financial modeling, one of the projects I've got at the moment for uh, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England is to make a game that we can all play where we can try and do things differently with the financial model of Europe using agent-based models to see if we can stop another financial crisis because Lord knows the last set of big <coughs> formulas that we were relating to failed. So can we use gaming for that? Can we use gaming to stop another crisis? Okay. Can we use gaming for climate? I completely agree with that. Uh, Andrew, Shirley, do you want to respond to anything? Yes. Oh, right. I was, I was just going to derail the discussion again. That's a really good <laughs> question. <laughs> but, you know, Cam keeps coming back to this behavioural science stuff. And, and I think he referred to, there's a phrase I couldn't no. catch my ear, which was the greats of behavioural economics, which to me sounds like the greats of Scottish goalkeeping. Um, <laughs> this is... Uh, <laughs> The, the, the problem with this, and it's fantastically useful for, for the marketing and advertising industries, is that it's not a science, it's a collection of anecdotes. There's, there's small-scale experiments conducted within kind of confines, and these are these behavioural confines that have great similarity to, to gaming, which I think was 
Cam's really interested and excited of it. That's fine. People selling more stuff is fine. There's these little kind of tricks and so on. There's, there are lots more of these little tricks to, to, to learn. But it's not science in the sense that you can just build on it. You can take it, use that as a body of knowledge, and then do some more science with it. But the marketing and advertising industries have always been found of, have had always a soft spot for, for junk science because it helps them sell stuff. And um, it, some of you probably know the story of Freud's nephew, Bernays, who went to America, invented public, modern public relations, I think he invented the term public relations. And he was selling the, you know, a very kind of simplified Freud to, to American um, advertising agencies and did very well for 50 years. I think, I think these kind of very small scale, um, very inconclusive and, and, and rather poor pseudoscience, <coughs> kind of junk science that we, we keeps being evoked on this panel, doesn't get us very far. Okay, um, Tor, do you want to so, come back? Yes, when it comes to learning, um, as parents, um, my wife sits at the back there, and she's an academic, by the way. Um, so we have tried to instill uh, learning into our son from day one. I've grown up in a very different society where you don't do schooling as you do in the UK, because I think it's hopeless uh, what you do. But that's my, my, my personal opinion. Uh, but he learned, did a lot of learning when he was little. He was unfortunate or fortunate enough to grow up with computers from the day he was born. And he spent uh, some time playing games. We were trying to uh, direct him in a certain direction, of course. But he learned a lot about behavior, tribunals, how to work with large groups of people through some of the very early um, MMOs. And I think it was fantastic for, for exactly that point. You learned how to get on with other people. And you learned how you had to behave in large groups and with very diverse groups of people. He had friends across the globe he played with. And they had very, very diff different cultural backgrounds. And they all managed to get on. They had to get on to reach their goals in the game. And he spent a lot of hours doing that. And we, as parents, were very, very happy about the way he learned some of those things. He's turned into a very good little social being, we think. But then most parents think that's about their, their kids anyway. Uh, but let, let me just take the last part of that. He learned a lot through interaction with other people, other kids, and online from day one. But he didn't start going to school until he was seven. But that's the way you do it in Norway anyway. So. Okay. Shirley, do you want to...? Yeah, I want to touch on two points. The psychology of gaming and the education point. Um, I think the psychology of gaming is really interesting around the freemium model, for example. It's a book by a guy called Nicholas um, Lovell, which is really interesting, called The Curve. And exactly, it's exactly this point. And it, it, it basically says that 50% of gaming revenue comes from 15% of the, the participants. So all games, if it's an industry they're after what they call the whales, which is a term that comes from gambling. So they're after the big spen spenders. They want to get you hooked, basically. Um, I hope I don't get sued for saying this, God forbid, but World of Warcraft, there are some, there are issues. Adults have got themselves into real pickles with this, right? So there is an issue, but you know what? Here's the thing. They're adults. They make a choice to do that, okay? They make a choice to do it. And we could go into the psychology of it, and I think there are problems, OK? But at the end of the day, this is what we, we're talking about. We're talking about people deciding for themselves. On the education point, actually, I've got no problem with a good teacher saying, I'm going to use something a bit innovative. The class aren't getting in this way. I'm going to try something interesting, be that gaming or something else. But I tell you what, it's not just about play, because I think I darn well hope underpinning that is knowledge underpinning that are <coughs> conversations in the class about the Magna Carta, if you're doing building dem democratic societies, that you're talking about Thomas Paine, that there's knowledge underpinning it, and it just doesn't become play to result in a particular outcome of a perfect society, which may or may not be there. So th that's my take on it. Right, more, more questions from yourselves. I think making games that are educational and that put across certain ideas and help you help to inform you is a great idea but when I want to go play a game I don't want to be getting a lesson in moral philosophy or having my decisions sort of influenced by certain aspects of the game I want to shoot some clones <laughs> Okay. Just, just to pick that up, there's a, there's a time where you want to watch The Simpsons and there's a time where you want to watch David Attenborough. 
I think the central point that's been made by Shirley, are the tools of play relevant and appropriate to the world of politics? And uh, Cam may want to persuade us that there's a difference between explanation and persuasion, but politics always pretends to explain when it's trying to persuade. And if you take the five dimensions of play, winning and losing, it shares with politics. Chance, it shares with politics. New tricks, it shares with politics. You could even argue that miniaturization, it shares with politics, because we're in a world of political dwarfs nowadays. But, well, you missed that one, but never mind. <laughs> uh, but there's one other aspect of play, which is very important, which is illusion, pre <coughs> illusion pretense, and the suspension of disbelief. Indeed, that's connected with narrative. And Ken Tynan said, mistaken identity is not only what the craft of acting is all about, it is what much of drama is all about. An actor is a man who pretends to be someone who is usually pretending to be someone else. Do we want deception and illusion and pretense and the suspension of disbelief to be part of our politics in 2014. Isn't that best left to the world of play, which is all groovy, when it isn't to turning, turning us into total addicts, of course, which is what some people seem to think. That's all right, dis dis suspending disbelief in computer games. But uh, Nick Clegg may beg belief, but I don't want to dis suspend my disbelief in him. I'm quite glad that Shirley, in her opening speech, mentioned Journey. Games that have a very strong story, or uh, make you build your own story, tend to instill better morals in you than, um, say, a game that is specifically designed to take you off of a certain path. So um, a game set out with the idea of stopping you from smoking or smoking less or eating less. Um, whenever a designer, a story, a writer will script these games, they'll come in with the uh, specific, specific intention of removing like reducing this aspect. So it's blindingly obvious in their games. Mm -hmm. So it works on young on the uh, younger gamers. However, as an older game, you tend to uh, get turned off these games because of the blindingly obvious facts. However, I played uh, Journey on its release, and that was an incredibly enriching experience because that, uh, because it's a game of complete isolation. It, it makes you go, uh, build closer bonds with your friends. Mm. And similarly, a bro uh, Brothers uh, was another game that had no uh, dialogue. It built, your, it built the story around you. Um, that, that made me cherish my family a lot more. It's something that's very specific when you build your own story. When a story is given to you, it's a lot less effective and... Um, in all honesty, a bit crap. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, so I think gamef uh, gamification is going to improve my life, uh, photography is super better, etc. But one of the uh, questions was, uh, is there a risk that such approaches trivialise important and difficult issues? So I found it interesting that uh, two of you mentioned tax and how gamification is going to improve collecting, collection of tax. And we're going to collect hundreds of millions more from individuals who are avoiding tax. Um, but the problem isn't individuals avoiding tax, it's the hundreds, of, uh, hundreds and billions of pounds that aren't paid by corporations every year. And they're the ones who are going to be making these game apps to improve the tax problem. Um, so I think we are trivialising a very important issue there. Uh, another big issue that came up was the European financial crisis. And I'm sure the banks will be really pleased that you're creating a game to fix that rather than chasing after them. So perhaps it is um, a political decision to choose who the problem solvers are and uh, appification and fundification is making individuals uh, responsible for solving society's dilemmas and removing the emphasis that's placed on institutions and uh, the people who make the games. I am kind of a bit biased again because I've been playing games since I was like five. I started uh, playing Tekken around that time because my dad was playing it and my dad's now a 50 year old uh, guy and <coughs> he's working really, really hard. So uh, I'm kind of connecting to the fact that uh, Dr. Dant, you said that uh, we that you don't mind gamification as long as uh, the as long uh, as uh, we stay serious as a person or something, and that uh, adults choose to actually be part of a uh, gamification and everything. Though I do think that. Uh, 
even younger younger people do choose to be part of a gamification because as an 18 year old I choose to play games and mostly it's because I just like to have fun with it but I have learned a lot uh, through it. I have uh, met so many people all around the world. Uh, I have uh, had uh, loads and loads of ideas while playing a, a game so that I would end up writing or drawing or whatever. I, and so, okay. um, and also I am uh, asking uh, Mr. Uh, Orlovsky. Briefly, because I want to... Yeah, Mr. Orlovsky, uh, you said that uh, because of the gamification we're living in, in fantasies. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, because of that, you think that maybe books and movies have the same, uh, same kind of effect on people? And what are your thoughts in general for the pa uh, uh, question for panel? Because there's loads and loads of uh, people going all around how uh, aggressive games are influencing uh, people's uh, people behavior okay. in general. So what are your opinion on aggression uh, that's being maybe influenced by games? So let, let's get the panel back in. Yeah, I don't think if, 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 uh, if you thought I said that, I must have been very clumsy with my words. I don't think uh, gamification uh, creates uh, a dangerous fantasy or any kind of fantasy for, for, for somebody and uh, I think we value literature cause, and, and, and movies because of their ability to transport you not just from where you are but kind of out of the self and, and games do that too and I think that's wonderful. Um, the only game I play is where I throw metal balls at um, glass uh, pyramids on my phone and that's mm -hmm. all there is to it. It's very nice ambient music. It's, uh, it's, that's all there is to it. That's all I want from it. Uh, and it's, it's quite beautiful. Can I just make one point on, on, on the edu education has come up several times and I think, I think, I don't know who said it, maybe it was Cam, as if this was the, the emblem of, of a kind of a new style of education where, hey, the kids could learn from themselves. Knowledge is just some kind of, you know, um, patriarchal construct or something like that. When you get to kind of my uh, wrinkly age, I don't wish I had more fun at school. I wish I'd done more of the boring mm. stuff that, and acquired. In some areas I did, but in some areas I didn't. And it's those where I didn't do the boring stuff that gives you a bedrock of knowledge on which you can then build later in life. Um, haven't we, I mean, the idea that kids are learning for themselves, that isn't new. Surely it's about, that is the orthodoxy for the last 20 or 30 years, correct me if I'm wrong, and it's that kind of, that is now coming out of fashion again as, as the okay. results are um, apparent. Cam, do you want to respond to that? And yeah, sure. Anything else? Um, yeah, but before that, uh, you mentioned small experiments and science and cheap tricks and like that, and I didn't hear an alternative to it and a comeback on that. Um, I think science is about experiments and about observation, and I think the biggest scientific observation that one could make, and one of the hardest things that you could do in your life, is to convince somebody to put their hand in their pocket to take out their credit card and to pay for something. And so if, they, uh, if to your uh, position of this is crap science, people are using it to great effect and people are spending their money, I think you're going to have to review that p p position. However, um, the chap up there mentioned kind of gave me a, you're either with us or against us kind of thing. You know, you're either, you know, helping us understand the financial industry or you're going after this or you're either going after the big corporates or you're getting people to pay tax more. That's nonsense. Uh, these things are not on and either or. Of course, we need to be doing all. The question is, can, what can we do and what are the tools that we have and the technologies that we have to tap into the collective intelligence in order to do more? And I am a liberal, liberal paternalist. I do believe that it's a good idea to try and persuade people, if we can, to do the things that they should um, and we know is right for the society and for the rest of us, of course, not to force them. But if, uh, and, and I take the point here about uh, games that are crap, uh, I've worked on things like teenage pregnancy, I've worked on things like prison rape, extremism, violence, and I've used role play and gameplay. And the effects I've had have been amazing. Those are stories that were pre-scripted, but given to people who are not actors, given to people who are using the medium of game in order to be able to speed up how quickly they can play a role. And the outcomes of it should speak for themselves. Folks continue to use them. I have caseworkers who work with particularly the, the troubled youth who say, look, Anecdotally, this guy, I've been trying to crack him for two years, he plays this game for 15 minutes and suddenly he's telling me how these characters are feeling in the game and I know he's talking about himself, but you've just given me a tool that makes him feel safe and secure and now he doesn't have to talk about himself, he talks about these characters on the screen and he can tell me how he feels. And isn't that a wonderful thing? 
Shirley, do you want to come back to some of those points? Yeah, I do, actually. Sorry to interrupt the clap there. Um, I am not a liberal paternalist, and I think right there you have the problem. It is not for you. What, who gives you the authority to say, I know better than you? Right there is the real nub of one of the problems I have with gamification. I just want to say to the... Uh, I think you, perhaps... I'm not against gaming, and I think you're talking about gaming. I'm talking about gamification, where you're using, I think, quite cynical techniques and this paternalistic attitude that we know what you feel, we know what you think, we know what's in your best interest. I think that's really dangerous. I really liked the um, point you made about building our own stories. And actually, I also think that shows people aren't fooled by it. You're what you want is to form your own social relationships. And I think Journey, I'm a words person, so you can imagine it has no sound, it, it has sound in it, but no communication. And that wonderful kind of narrative arc, it's, it's set in a desert and you're a sole person apart from you meet another player and you guide each other. by a, It's a cloak, isn't it? It's a sort of chime. There's something wonderful about that interaction. It's so human. What I am concerned about in gamification is the sucking out of that humanity to say, you are, my you are my subject, you're an object that I can examine and steer on this path that I think is better. I think it's really problematic. And okay. we can argue about people in prison and all the rest of it. I think it's really problematic. Tor, do you want to respond to that? In, in the end, uh, you're all going to vote with your feet. I would say Tor had uh, some very good philosophies behind that in addition to staring down a gun barrel. But I've worked, i spent a lot of time working on what is undoubtedly the world's largest online game. And it was built by gamers, by players, for players. It was not built for marketing purposes. It was not built to suck out as much money as possible. There were no advertising and a lot of money was spent on making sure you had a good time. And by the way, it's a freemium game. They're still making a billion pounds a year on it, but that's, that's a slightly different story. Uh, no one managed to go bust on buying anything in-game because nothing is that expensive in the game. But modern games like League of Legends actually have a fairly serious social aspect to them. Any of you that haven't played the game, look up cosplay on the internet and see what people do outside of the game. It's absolutely amazing to see. And the company and the people behind the company spent an enormous amount of time on debating being responsible and socially responsible people, even though you killed some monsters in the game. I just want to take a final few kind of questions. My point is a little bit more directed to Shirley. Uh, I think you develop a highly intellectual uh, discussion there and argument, but I, and I think you would do even better if you reminded yourself why games are played. So just to remind, the reason why League of Legends and World of Warcraft is played, because it's rewarding, yes? It's rewarding and also there is competition. And why is competition there? Because winning that competition is rewarding. So the answer is reward, okay? Now think of the time when you were writing a book, because you're, uh, as an author, when you were writing a book, late at night, what kept you up to sit and do that boring job? Maybe long-term rewards, maybe financial compensation, and so on, greatness, okay? Now, you're, you have a, every one of us also has a child living. Can you try and be yep. brief? Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> every one of us has a child living inside of us who doesn't understand that serious side. He's the child that's saying, let's go home now, in all of us here. And, and, and if you manage to employ that child by turning the job into a game, then you would have the full personality of yourself working towards that goal and get there quicker. I think it's strange that the panel has accepted it as obvious that you can't nudge your way to a better health service because one of the canonical examples of the nudge program is people wash, is doctors washing their hands and of course um, I wouldn't want to go to a hospital where the, do the doctors didn't understand intellectually that washing your hands is a good idea but I also wouldn't want to go to a hospital where the doctors didn't wash their hands and if you can gamify washing your hands and get more doctors actually doing it, then you can, in fact, improve the health service. I just want to make a really brief point. It sounds like the issue isn't with gamification, because technically, I, I used to be in the Scouts. 
I used to want to get all the badges on my arm to do all my different um, yeah. skills, like uh, get all the achievement for it. But what we're arguing about is who decides where the fly in the <laughs> urinal goes and who has the power to do that. Yes, they're just tools. Cam was saying it's not either or. Uh, but implicit in all these discussions and unstated is the idea that the existing tools don't work. So I have no problem with uh, a teacher finding a creative use for Minecraft. I do have a problem with people uh, treating gamification as the answer to problems of motivation in education. So be brief. Uh, try and sum up. I was really interested in this point about reward and winning and losing. Actually, I do think there's some, that is something that gaming and politics have in common. It is about winning or losing at the end of the day. But here's my part, because gaming is play, right? Not great consequences, we think, if you win or lose. <coughs> but here's what I would say about politics. Actually, it's not for somebody else to decide what my interest, what I want to win or I want to lose is. And that's why I've got a real problem with gamification. It's up to us to decide what my self-interest is, not for somebody else to tell me what's in my best interest. I want to have the fight to win the politics that are in my interest, that I believe are better, that will make a better world. That's where I'm coming from. Fantastic. So next, um, Cam. So final thoughts on liberal paternalism. A liberal paternalist says, wear your seat belt. A liberal paternalist says, if you are a doctor, wash your hands. But also might say, pay your taxes. I don't want to live in a society where people are telling me that they want to make their own decisions on these things because I just don't think it's great to go around not washing your hands, not wearing a seatbelt, and not wearing, but paying your taxes. But to sum up, I want to quote my favorite um, lady of all time, Mary Poppins. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. Find the fun and snap, the job's a game. Andrew. Obviously, I tend to agree with Shirley. We've, we've kind of gone around so many interesting things here. It's been far more interesting than just talking about gamification. I think we've touched on education, tax. I think ultimately, Shirley's, I'd echo Shirley's point that it's corrosive, it's very kind of corrosive of democracy to, to imagine that they dare do this to us. Um, the example of the health service, that's a tiny, tiny example, but it doesn't address the institutional. Why don't we just go out and see how other people do it? The answers aren't simple, but they aren't rocket science in terms of local institutions, accountability of, of, of where the health service, um, <clears throat> accountability of the staff, the, the deployment of the resources. All across Europe, you have very rich examples of how health services are run that actually have better outcomes than we do. Um, are we really kind of doing marketing tricks on doctors? I've look, really looked um, and tried to research where um, Nudge works, and the most quoted example in the newspapers is where probably running out of time, but um, great success was claimed for a campaign where people did more organ donations. When you actually look at the, uh, the results of, and various kind of copy fra copywriting phrases we used, all almost identical. What made the difference was just putting on millions of websites, the driving license website, why not uh, um, give your organ? In other words, there was no behavioral science. What Cam describes is simply the age old art of copywriting with a bit of science blarney tacked on. Sorry, I think I'll just be repeating myself if I add any more to that. OK, thank you. And last talk. So my premise at the start was that we have the rise of the digital natives now. And I think uh, research shows us that that happens around 2017. We are sitting here as a panel, a group of people that are way too old to be digital <laughs> natives and debating what the digital natives are going to do in the future. I find that funny. I'm 61 now, so I find that uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, whatever we do... Uh, we have to have an opinion and we have to try to influence games in, in the right direction. I think that's the important part because there's nothing we can do about stopping the rise of games at the moment. And there are definitely positive sides to it, very positive social sides to it. And the generation growing up are not stupid. They see this as well. And the more successful games and uses of gamification is going to be the people that understand how this works. That's Fantastic. It. So can we give our speakers a really big round of applause for a fantastic debate?